Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome and thank you for uh, being here for this session on uh, the role of physiotherapy in disaster uh, response recovery and preparedness. Uh, my name is Chiara Rettis. I'm a rehabilitation advisor. Uh, I work for Handicap International, um, especially in uh, South Asia. And since uh, 10 years, I've been involved in the support of uh, development programs, development of rehabilitation services, um, but also in preparedness um, activities that includes uh, physiotherapy and uh, in the response as well. And I'm very happy to uh, introduce you the three speakers uh, of today. Uh, Sunil Pokarel, who is the uh, secretary of the Nepal Physiotherapy Association. And he's in, been involved since many years now uh, in the development of rehabilitation services in Nepal and, re and disability programs. He's a trainer and a clinical uh, physical therapist too. Uh, Phil Shepard uh, is a Canadian physiotherapist and uh, is um, a rehabilitation uh, consultant uh, for IOM and is now uh, started a PhD um, with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. He's also the chair of the uh, Global Health uh, uh, Canadian Association. Uh, okay. Uh, and then we have um, uh, Peter Skelton, who is a physiotherapy for therapist from the UK. Uh, and he's uh, a rehabilitation and disability advisor for uh, and humanitarian uh, advisor for Handicap International and involved in the UK emergency uh, team uh, project uh, and now also in the, sorry, I'm new to this chairing. <laughs> in, okay, uh, in the uh, medical team uh, basically response in the UK. Um, so uh, today uh, we will be focusing on the disaster management cycle. That means we will be touching uh, the three main components of disaster management, which is uh, not only response and uh, recovery, but also the preparedness. And we are particularly interested in, in these three elements because uh, as per uh, physical therapy and uh, the meaning uh, of the um, rehabilitation process, um, it is very important to look at the connections between these three uh, dimensions. They are essential to really make a difference in the response that, mm, that we are able to make and the effects for the communities what, uh, affected by a disaster. Um, one last note, uh, we are talking uh, about a sudden onset uh, disasters, so natural hazards. Uh, we will not be really touching uh, outbreaks or other situations, uh, chronic crisis, where uh, the role of the physiotherapist is also essential. Uh, but today we will bring uh, the case of Nepal, uh, because Nepal uh, is, uh, includes, in fact, uh, the, the three elements uh, that I introduced to you. So both preparedness, uh, response, and also recovery and health system strengthening uh, types of activities. So uh, the three physiotherapists who are going to uh, share their experience were involved in a very different way uh, in, uh, in disaster response, preparedness, uh, and recovery. Uh, but uh, they all uh, are exceptional in the sense that they made a big difference uh, and uh, also through innovation uh, in the way uh, the response was uh, managed uh, in Nepal. 
Uh, and I'd like also to thank the WCPT um, to um, provide the opportunity to discuss about this uh, very important topic. Uh, WCPT has been very uh, active in, you know, since many years now in promoting the role of uh, physiotherapy in disaster response uh, and disaster management. Uh, so now we have uh, resources, we have policy uh, papers that are very uh, important resources for all of us. Um, before we start, I'd like to do a little survey among you and see who among you have been involved in a response. Can you stand up? Oh, stand up, we are more physical. Okay. And who has been involved in uh, recovery or service development after a disaster? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, thank you. And who has been involved in preparedness? Okay, so I think uh, this session uh, will be very rich and now I leave the uh, floor to Sunil Pokarel, uh, who will um, share his experience uh, in Nepal as a physiotherapist and through the professional association. Uh, First of all, I'd like to thank WCPT uh, for allowing, allowing us to share our experience of the ground that we faced in Nepal in 2015. So here I am presenting on behalf of Nepalese physiotherapists and the Nepal Physiotherapy Associations. I would like to start my presentations with the background about Nepal Physiotherapy Associations and vulnerability of Nepal for disasters. Nepal is ranked as 37 out of 172 countries, it's 37 vulnerable countries in the world for disaster. When we talk about the earthquake, it's 11th most vulnerable countries in terms of seismic hazard. In Nepal, we face earthquake. In every monsoons, we face flood, landslide, and on the northern part of the country, we have a Himalayas. So glacial lake outburst is also one of the disaster we face. So. The country is very much prone to disaster. And now we think with the experience of Nepal earthquake 2015, we think that preparedness is must to mitigate the catastrophic effect of these disasters. And physiotherapists and the professional associations has a lot to do on this part. So, Nepal Physiotherapy Association is only one association of physiotherapists in Nepal. In Nepal, we have 2,000 physiotherapists that are registered in Nepal Health Professional Council. This is the official regulating body of government of Nepal. But we have only 300 physiotherapists, 50 physiotherapists involved as a member in Nepal Physiotherapy Associations. We have a lot to do, you know, to make the remaining physiotherapist is a member of association. Of the available physiotherapists, most of them are engaged in private facilities, private hospitals, and very few are engaged in government services. So it means that the health system of Nepal, they have very few physiotherapists at present also. Uh, we partners with various agencies in Nepal before earthquake also and after earthquake. One of our important partner is Kathmandu University School of Medical Science, which is only one physiotherapy school in Nepal. One of our, another partner is Handicap International Nepal that has a long presence in Nepal and has been doing a lot of work in the rehabilitations, development of rehabilitation services. Similarly, we are partnering with the OT PNO associations, specialized rehabilitation centers, 
in spinal injury and the children with disability. As a professional associations, our key actions are promoting the continuing professional development. We do a conference once in a couple of years. We do a trainings, partnering with the humanitarian agencies, uh, the universities, and the other important part of our work is the advocacy and awareness. For us, the integrations of rehabilitations into a health system is our agenda, and we try to focus this message in our advocacy and awareness actions. So we are a group of physiotherapists as executives of uh, the associations, and we do it voluntarily. We don't have any staff. What we do is all voluntary work. So in this scenario, the, we use Facebook, we use Twitter, and we have a website so through which we connect with our stakeholders and the member physiotherapists. So April 25th, 2015, it was a catastrophic day in the history of Nepal. We had an earthquake of 7.9 magnitude, causing the death of almost 9,000 people and injury on around 22,000 people. Almost one third of the health facilities were damaged. If you look at the map, the area with the red color is, was the most affected area. It covers the 14 district on the central locations of Nepal, including the capital city, Kathmandu. Kathmandu is uh, one of the most developed city of Nepal, and as I said to it, there are other districts, other three districts that has surgical and rehabilitation facilities. But other remaining 10 districts, they don't have a rehabilitation and surgical facilities. So the effect of the earthquake was maximum on the districts where there was no surgical and rehabilitation service. So all the injured survivors they were brought to Kathmandu, to nearby hospitals, through ambulances, by helicopters, or by carrying. And there was a huge overload on the hospitals around the Kathmandu. The capacity of the hospital was less in comparison to the numbers of injured survivors they were receiving. Now, the first day of the earthquake. So this is the pictures taken on the first day of the earthquake. The earthquake occurred at 12 p.m. And the physiotherapists were there in the ground immediately after the tree house. You can see a physiotherapist assembling a wheelchair there, but Nepal is a country where the assistive devices are not made. It's not easily available. But on the first day, you can see in picture, there is one physiotherapist assembling the wheelchairs. So we are going to talk about this availability of the assistive devices on the other slides. And the second day onwards, Nepal Physiotherapy Associations, in partnership with already existing physiotherapy units and the hospital around Kathmandu, the only one physiotherapy school, started to collaborate with each other because the need of injury management and rehabilitation was high. The peoples were brought from the other districts. So there was a huge requirement of physiotherapists and ne Nepal Physiotherapy Associations through its network was able to provide the volunteer physiotherapist to the area where it is required. And also, Nepal Physiotherapy Associations identified the places or people who require a rehabilitation service but are not on the reach. So we try to mobilize our member physiotherapists and try to provide the services there. This is a picture of 
Kashmir University School of Medical Science. So it is a big tertiary hospitals having a student physiotherapist lecturers and it was able to cover the rehabilitation services for the earthquake affected people that were brought from the eastern affected area of Nepal. The rehabilitation response activities were the physiotherapy. So within the physiotherapy, so it was first was the safe transfer from the vehicles to the bedside, then providing bed mobilizations exercise, range of motions exercises, providing the assistive devices and user training for the assistive devices were the main activities we are doing. Also, there were amputations, there were spinal injuries and fractures requiring assistive devices. So there was a collaboration established with the professional associations of PNO and OT to work together on the hospitals where there is a high load. So now I'm going to share you some slides. I have extracted these slides from our Facebook page. So what we did. So 25th April was the day we faced the earthquake. So at that day, we were not able to do anything. We were stabilizing ourselves that day on the 26th of April. So this is the update we made. We requested, we had a need assessment on one of the big hospital, tertiary hospital, and we found that there is a need of access support. And this is how we try to convey our message to our member physiotherapists. Similarly, there were humanitarian agencies in the field who were already there in Nepal before the earthquake, then Nepal Physiotherapy Associations established the collaborations with the humanitarian agencies. And in synergy, the rehabilitation service was delivered in the major government hospitals. The next important thing at the policy level was there was a formation of a cluster that is called the injury rehabilitation soft cluster. So it was led by Ministry of Health and this cluster was formed to coordinate the rehabilitation response activities. The members of these clusters were professional associations, service providers, and the officials from Ministry of Health. So we were also the part of clusters as associations. Similarly, the Ministry of Health at that time acknowledged the importance of rehabilitations before rehabilitations was, you know, it was not too acknowledged. Now, after the earthquake, there was a high demand of rehabilitation service. As it was a national issue, the rehabilitations was focused more. And the long-term, medium-term, and the short-term rehabilitations plans were made from Ministry of Health. And Nepal Physiotherapy Associations was also a part of it and we are able to contribute on this plan. One of the important uh, activities as associations, what we did is, uh, so there were NGOs and the humanitarian agencies that were recruiting the physiotherapists, but the media system, the newspaper system was not so good at that time, but our internet service was good, so Nepal Physiotherapy Associations was able to disseminate the message of the requirement of physiotherapists for the various service providers. And it was able to link physiotherapists to the service provider. Similarly, we try to disseminate the updates to our member physiotherapists what is going at the central level, policy level, what is going at the hospital or service level. We try to promote the referrals from one place to another place. We try to encourage our member physiotherapists to refer 
the people, if they found, if the people are deprived of the emergency rehabilitation service. So these are the list of activities that we did. So first was on the second day of earthquake, we tried to request our member physiotherapist to support, to go to the hospital, to support on the response activities. Then we worked with the service provider to get the more physio for them. At policy level, we participated on the injury rehabilitation soft cluster, and we provided our input to make the rehabilitations plan for the injured survivors. So the injury rehabilitation soft clusters. So this is a group of organizations that was led by Ministry of Health, that is called MOSP, and WHO. And it is participated by the humanitarian agencies and the professional associations also. So it was a forum for the information actions, need identifications for the rehabilitations, and support the Ministry of Health on their long-term plan. Later on, this cluster was converted into a technical working group, which is still supporting the Ministry of Health to define the long-term plan and policies in rehabilitation service. And Nepal Physiotherapy Association is also a part of it. Just before one month, just before the one month of the earthquake, so it was uh, February 2015, there was a big uh, disability workshop in Nepal. So by that time, the priority of Ministry of Health in rehabilitations was less. But the workshop was organized to sensitize the Ministry of Health, to make them understand about the importance of rehabilitations as an important component in a health system. Just after a few months, we had an earthquake, and Ministry of Health designated a focal unit in, for the rehabilitations and disability management. The same focal unit was the lead of injury rehabilitation subcluster, and the same focal unit is now leading the long-term policy making for rehabilitations. And Nepal Physiotherapy Association is part of technical working group that is supporting this unit still now. So Nepal was already ranked as the 11th most vulnerable country for earthquake. So there were some preparedness work done in Nepal before the earthquake. So the preparedness was focused on enhancing the response capacity of health professionals in case of emergency. So the trauma protocols guidelines and the trainings were developed and it was delivered to the group of doctors, nurses, and physiotherapists. And these trauma protocol guidelines were utilized by national and international medical team during the earthquake. In Nepal, we don't have a manufacturer of assistive devices like wheelchairs, uh, prosthetics, uh, orthotics. So we uh, do an international procurement to get these things uh, in Nepal. Uh, but during the preparedness, a bulk of assistive devices were already stockpiled on the central location. That was National Disabled Fund. And on the first day, the devices like a brace, crotch, and the wheelchairs were delivered on the first day of the earthquake. So it was in Kathmandu. The preparedness work was done in Kathmandu, so uh, the delivery of devices to the hospital was only possible in the Kathmandu, not on the other districts. Because before the earthquake, our assumption was that earth, a big earthquake would come in Kathmandu and it, will be, it is only an area to be affected. But what happened is the Kathmandu was also affected, but also the other districts outside the Kathmandu were also affected. Then at the recovery phase, as I said, most of the people were brought from the remote districts to the capital for the treatment. Then slowly, 
they started getting discharged and get back to their home village. But they would still require a follow-up. And they belong to an area where there is no rehabilitation service. Then, Ministry of Health, with the support of donor and humanitarian agencies, they established a physiotherapy unit on the district settings. It was the partnership with Ministry of Health. This was something that we were aiming before the earthquake. As a professional association, we have been all, always advocating on having the physiotherapist at least at district level. But, you know, that was not working before the earthquake. So, though the disaster was catastrophic to us, it was also an opportunity to establish the rehabilitation service at the district level. Here I like to summarize the role of professional associations again. So the professional associations has a huge role from the preparedness in a response and also in recovery. They can encourage member, member professionals to contribute on the preparedness and the rehabilitation response. They can support the service providers on getting the good human resource. They can support the Ministry of Health on defining their rehabilitation plan, and they can support the quality assurance for emergency rehabilitation services. So in Nepal, through the injury rehabilitation subcluster, we were able to make a service pathway for the people with amputee, amputations. So where to get the service, how to get the prosthetics, we were able to make a service pathway together with the prosthetic and orthotic associations, which was well agreed and followed. And also, the professional associations can be uh, mediators with foreign medical team with the expertise in rehabilitations to build up the capacity of the national professionals uh, who were involved in response. So during the Nepal earthquake, so there was a debate, you know, are Nepalese physiotherapists are competent enough to handle this. So there was a discussion on the early days of response. But we know that in Nepal, we are 2,000 physiotherapists already available there. Then, so it was agreed that the Nepalese physiotherapists would lead the treatment of the survivors and the helping hands who were coming from other countries. They supported the capacity building of Nepalese physiotherapists. So the injury rehabilitation subcluster, as I was stressing from the beginning, it converted into a technical group to support the Ministry of Health. And now we have a Nepal health sector strategy. For the first time, physiotherapy has been included as a basic healthcare package that the Ministry of Health committed to ACO from the community. Similarly, we have Tenure action plan on disability management, where you can see the commitment of Ministry of Health to have more physiotherapists at the district, to have a more physiotherapists in the health system. But as a professional association, we also face few challenges. So our work to the association is voluntary. And although we were engaged in preparedness, that was more focused on the training on trauma and rehabilitations. But we are not aware how should we operate in case of emergency. So we were in dilemma on the first day. And the next thing is we are getting a request from a lot of international friends for their interest to volunteer, but we are not able to address them as the Nepalese physiotherapists were leading uh, the rehabilitation's response. So the earthquake was devastating, but it served an opportunity for us to prove the relevancy of physiotherapy service in Nepal, in the district, in the central level health system. Now we understood that the professional associations like us holds a great role in disaster management. Now 
we are also confident that in case of similar disasters, we can lead the, the ground level response activities and the capacity building trainings through the foreign medical teams helped a lot to manage the complicated cases and coordinations with like-minded associations like PNOs and the OTs promotes the interdisciplinary care and for us the social networking sites our Facebook page was very important that helped us to disseminate the message that help us to link with the member physiotherapists who have interest on supporting the response activities. There are a lot of associations, humanitarian agencies, and organizations who supported us on behalf of Nepal and Nepal physiotherapy associations. I would like to thank all those helping hands who supported Nepal right from the first day to the time of recovery and still we are at the recovery phase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sunil, for uh, this very comprehensive uh, overview of the uh, of the role of the professional association and all this connectiveness that was a bit spontaneous, a bit uh, prepared uh, and a bit supported uh, by uh, international uh, mechanisms like the injury rehabilitation subcluster that was uh, established in really in very few days after the uh, the disaster so this was also very special now um, we will collect your questions uh, at the end of the three presentations uh, the next presentation is by um, is about the, the establishment of a step down facility uh, in a uh, affected district in a remote area of the country to try to address and respond uh, the needs of follow-up of a huge number of uh, survivors and injured um, that uh, needed to go back home but were still in need of, of care. Uh, so Phil Shepard, please. Thank you, Kara, and uh, thank you, Sunil. I think um, one of the things that I think is amazing and beautiful about what Sunil was sharing is that everything from the immediate response and everything that I'll be speaking about and what Pete is going to be speaking about was done by the Nepalese physiotherapist. And you see that all the pictures is Nepalese providing the care, and that's uh, something that you saw from the acute stage all the way to the long-term development of the country. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that. So. Now what I'm going to be talking about is kind of following what Sunil said is what happens to these patients when after the acute stage and how do we support them in the interim before we get to the long-term development and, and building the capacity of rehabilitation in the country. I think I should also highlight how um, it's amazing how you're sitting right there. I like it's perfect for pictures because you're all sitting in the middle. So if you can take it, it'll look like the room, take the pictures from the back, it'll look like the room is full. So. That's nice. So I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about the, uh, the earthquake in Nepal, uh, following what Sunil said, and then uh, the continuum of care of the patient, and talking about one of the strategies that we use uh, to ensure that there's follow-up after patients leave the hospital, and talking specifically about a step-down care facility that was developed by IOM in one of the remote communities in, uh, in Nepal. So, um, as Sunil was saying, so around 8,000 deaths and around over 22,000 injuries, and 1,500 of those people, it's estimated, will require some, term, uh, some form of long-term rehab and care. Uh, one of the other things that was highlighted and that is really important in this case is that the majority of the damage and the injuries occurred in rural areas. 
So Nepal, uh, mid, most of its healthcare infrastructure is located in large urban centers such as Kathmandu, but you can see in this map that the majority of the damage was actually in a lot of the rural areas to the north. So what happens is, in these cases is that there are thousands and thousands of people coming from all over the country to these urban centers and these primary acute healthcare facilities. And when these patients receive care, they are then stuck with a dilemma because they have no safe place to return to. And this obviously is, is problematic for the patient, but in addition to that, a lot of them are medically ready to leave the hospital, but they're not functionally ready to go home. So they're able to go back and, and survive in their communities, but they're not able to par participate fully uh, within their societies. So they're not functionally ready. And this again causes a backlog on the primary healthcare facilities because uh, these patients are taking up needed hospital resources for the acute patients that are coming in, that are constantly coming from the communities. So let me introduce you to Bimala. So this is a, um, a patient who was injured in the earthquake in Nepal. She was at, her daughter was four months old at the time and she was in her house. And she managed to get out of her house with her baby in her arms, and when she escaped, her neighbor's house actually fell on her, and she ended up fracturing her leg. Um, and her, her child had some minor injuries, but uh, was otherwise okay. So Bimala stayed in the hospital for, she received a surgery and, and a cast, and she stayed in the hospital for four months. And when she was discharged, the, the doctor told her to receive rehab care in her community. Uh, but the problem was that Bimala was from a rural community where you could see the red on that map, and there were no rehab services available there. So what happened is part of uh, the role that IOM was playing is that they had an assisted discharge and referral team, so they were transferring patients from the hospitals to the communities and from the communities to the hospitals. So Bimala was transferred back to her community in Sindhu Palchuk, and um, when she was there, she was helped by her family and the, the ADR team and was carried back to her town. Um, of course, so Bimala's house was damaged. So initially she moved into a tin structure, which is kind of what you can see in the back left of the, of the picture. But she found it, there was no electricity and it was getting really warm and they were worried about uh, infection there. So, and she wasn't comfortable. So they provided her with a tent. And that's where she stayed. And she, had, she was kind of lost hope. So previously her, her, her husband was working and because of her or his um, wife's injury, he was unable to go back to work. So affecting not only the individual, but the family and the community. So what happens to patients like Bimala? So where can they go be before the health system is strengthened enough to hopefully take care of them? One strategy is the development of a step-down care facility. So has anyone heard of a step-down facility? Put your hands up. Okay. That's pretty good. So I, I know there are some, uh, not only in, in this type of setting, but it's also useful in any area where people need ongoing treatment after they leave the hospital and before they go home. So this could be in low resource settings. It could be high resource. Um, it could be useful across a wide variety of, of uh, locations. So it's basically a, a transitional rehabilitation facility with two main goals. So improve function for the patient and reduce burden on the medical facility. Now I know there, there are other goals associated with that, but that's kind of the main ones that, uh, that come up. So IOM was, was transferring patients and they found that um, they were going home, not functional enough to participate and go back to work. So they decided that uh, along with, uh, and I'll touch on a little bit, with the help of the government and the, the subcluster to start us a step-down care facility. So we, the first was deciding where to actually do this. So if we look at the map, so Sindhu Palchak is the one that's in deep purple on the top. So and that's describing the number of homes that were destroyed. So over 90% of the buildings in that area were damaged. And it accounted for around 2,100 injuries. 
And there was extensive damage to healthcare infrastructure. So the district hospital, which was located in Chotada, was damaged. There was a primary healthcare center that was damaged. 62 health posts were completely destroyed, and 19 health facilities were partially damaged. So then that's how they decided on the, the district itself. Um, and then it was a matter of finding where exactly within the district they would place this step-down care facility. So, and then they settled on, on Chotada, and that's uh, highlighted in yellow there. And this was, they decided on this for a number of reasons. So the central location within the district, and you can see that the affected areas of that district are highlighted in red, so widespread damage and, and uh, destruction within the area. Um, so Chotada had road access, so it was relatively easy to transport patients to and from the facility, and it was also the home of the district hospital. So this allowed for really good collaboration between the step-down care facility and the hospital, and it integrated the, the care, or the goal was to integrate care within the primary healthcare facilities that were there. Um, and really to supplement the care until the, the district hospital could be rebuilt. So the mission was to contribute to improve function and treatment outcomes for survivors um, and people requiring injury rehab care in the district. And then also to support the district hospital in training staff and transitioning rehab services from the facility to the new hospital once it was built. It was also integrated within the response and the national strategy. So again, highlighting the work that uh, the, the Nepalese physiotherapists and the governments were doing. So it was based on documents that were developed, such as the post-disaster needs assessment that was done by the National Planning Commission and the governments in Nepal. And then also the Rehabilitation Action Plan, which was uh, developed by the Injury and Rehabilitation Subcluster. So really integrated within the whole response. So the the criterion for admission for patients was that they were medically stable and that they'd benefit from short duration, high intensity rehabilitation, and that we, we, weren't, act we weren't providing active medical interventions. And um, that's when it was good to have that collaboration with the district hospital because we could refer them there. Uh, there were also, so patients uh, injured or disabled with three characteristics. One, that they would need between one and three months of rehab. Second is that they had a high likelihood of recovering. And third is that they had a, a caretaker that was willing to stay there and, and support their rehabilitation while they were there. So the people that um, were not admitted to the center because of ongoing care that was, would have been required are um, long -term re people requiring long-term rehab or uh, lifelong disabilities. Children under five years of age, patients with spinal cord injuries with neurological involvement, and patients with chronic wounds. And that was just because of the, uh, the capacity at the center itself. So when the patients were admitted, they were placed into, they went through a, an assessment with a physiotherapist, a nurse, a psychosocial worker, a social worker, and the paramedic, and the, the physician from the district hospital, and then they were placed into one of three categories. And these were dependent on time. So category A were, were patients that required less than four weeks of rehab. Category B was between four to eight weeks of rehabilitation. And category C was between kind of eight to 16 or, or eight plus weeks of rehab. And what you can notice here, so the, the people in category A were kind of the most high had the most independence, so they were expected to do a lot of independent rehab throughout the day, and only around one hour or so with the rehabilitation uh, providers or with the physiotherapist. And then if we go to the other end, so category C, which is kind of the more severe injuries and disabilities, they uh, did a little bit of independent work with their care providers and more time with the physiotherapist, around three hours. So it was we were providing high intensity rehab while they were there. And the idea was that by providing high intensity rehab, we can help get people through the system faster so that we can have a higher turnover rate. 
So some of the services that were provided, we had rehabilitation, 24-hour nursing care, psychosocial support, group activities, uh, weekly medical assessments, accommodation, and the patients and the caregivers were, uh, were responsible for their self-care activities as much as they could do on their own, and they were supported in that by the rehab professionals when needed. So really trying to work on, on improving function. So we had 40 beds, and there were tw uh, 20 of those were for patients, and we knew that by including caregivers in the rehab that we could improve the outcomes while they were there, but also continue the care when they were at home. So 20 of those beds were also for caregivers. There was a, a rehab room, and I put area because the, the tent that you see in the back is actually the rehab facility. And then the area in front is where they did gait training a lot of their, and a lot of their exercises. And there was a psychosocial area that was private, um, a transition home that I'll get to in a minute, nurses area, patient wash facilities, and then staff housing and, and storage and all that. So in terms of uh, human resources, so there was a, a medical coordinator, a triage focal point, which was the a medical officer at the local hospital who would assess patients before they came to our facility to see if they were appropriate. We had a facility manager, three physiotherapists, four nurses, social worker, psychosocial counselor, a paramedic, and then caretakers, cooks, cleaners. Um, so you can see that it's, there were a lot of people here. And I think one of the, the most important things to point out is that all of these individuals were Nepalese uh, healthcare workers and um, people living in that area. So, okay, so we've developed the, the facility and so now we're gonna see how we get patients to actually get there. Um, so here's kind of the referral pathway. So we have uh, everyone from the district or the hospitals and anyone identified in community outreach going to that triage focal point who then does the admission criteria, see if they're appropriate, um, and then they go through the system where we give them a category and they go through their uh, intensive rehabilitation. So Bimala, so one of the things we did with her is that she was a farmer, which is like most people uh, in rural Nepal. So what we did was we worked on different functional activities such as farming, uh, walking to the local temple, and doing group activities, because in Nepal, there's a lot of focus on uh, family and community. When Bimala was leaving, and all the patients had the opportunity to go through a transit home, and this is a home that's designed in the same way that a regular home would be in that area. Um, and it gives the patients the opportunity to practice activities of daily living in support of a physiotherapist and the rehab team. To, see, to make sure that they're able to actually do these activities and in a lot of cases overcome some of the fear and um, apprehension that they had in going home. So after Bimala went through, uh, this is one of the things that she said, so it was really good for me to practice here in the transit home. Now I feel as though I can do this and when I go home it will be no problem. So on discharge we uh, made sure that everything was integrated within the community. So that they had appropriate follow-up within the, either the government or local rehab providers. And then we'd follow up to make sure that everything was uh, going according to plan. Then when, when they're looking at um, the exit strategy, so this is something that shouldn't just be a temporary solution that then just disappears after that stage. So uh, the options really even before you start the, the facility should be speaking with the government to see what you're going to do um, and linking it with the pre-existing services. So in, in this case either transferring it to the government or rehab partners. And one of the things that we did while we were there is we conducted some research to see the functional outcomes. Um, and what we, what we need to do in the future also is to see where else this can be applicable. So to see whether it can be used in conflict or in low resource setting and high resource to improve outcomes for patients. Thank you.
Thank you, Phil. I think um, uh, the description of this uh, model, uh, quite uh, innovative, uh, and trying to address these uh, big needs uh, in underserved uh, areas. Um, even if it is a transitional kind of model, it, uh, it has already all the features of a rehabilitation system um, as a whole system. I mean, uh, you touched uh, important aspects like referral system, how to create the links with the community, uh, what is discharge process, uh, follow-up process that are so important um, for uh, the quality of the outcomes. I now leave, uh, please, um, Peter Skelton will uh, do an overview of uh, policies, frameworks, and the standards in uh, disaster management and physiotherapy. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. I just want to echo Phil's comments as well, really, to congratulate Sunil, and I know there is a number of Nepalese colleagues in the room as well on the outstanding response that those guys ran, both from before and, and continuing to this day uh, in the earthquake. So really, congratulations to Sunil and the rest of you. What I'm going to try to do now is to bring everything together for me by giving you a bit more of a global perspective, but also drawing on, on examples from the Nepal response. If we look at the history of disasters, this is some, some data from, from EMDAT, what we can see is that over time, actually more and more people are being affected by, by disasters, and what seems to be happening is that the frequency of disasters is also increasing. Now, that's slightly misleading. What's actually happening is we're living in more and more hazardous areas, and so we're more prone to disasters. So the number of earthquakes is the same, it's just that they're affecting us more and more. However, at the same time, positively, what we're seeing is that overall mortality from, from disasters is actually coming down. So along with that, you would think, okay, that's great. So we're moving in a really, really good direction. Unfortunately, decreasing mortality doesn't necessarily equate to decreasing morbidity. So actually, if we look at what's going on um, in, in conflict and we extrapolate from that at the moment, actually, the better our pre-hospital services become and the better our medical services become at responding to disasters, actually we're likely to see more people with catastrophic injuries surviving, not less people. And I think Nepal gives a really good example of that where you had an organized pre-hospital system in place, you had a really well-run national response, and as a consequence, we had a much higher number of spinal cord injuries than we've seen in previous disasters. So we can see the knock-on effect of that and the reason that rehabilitation then continues to remain really important in responses. What you can see here is along the bottom, um, is the severity of the hazard itself, so the severity of the earthquake or the tsunami. Um, and up the side, we can see the income of the country. And so what we can use from this is we can say that actually in, in very high income countries, even with a very severe disaster, they're able to manage that disaster themselves and their health system is likely to survive and they're not likely to require international support. If we go into the middle areas with, with Vanuatu and Chile, what you can see is moderate um, disasters they may require some international support, but not always. And it's only when you get this combination of a, a severe hazard really in a, in a poorly developed health system or in a low income country when we start to see problems. And so Nepal kind of sits on the edge because it's a, a, a developing health system with, with quite good capacity, but it was a very severe disaster. If we look then to, to the likes of Haiti and to Ebola where the health system was very quickly overwhelmed, you can see that the need for international support is much greater. But to emphasize, and to continue to emphasize through this, the key to response in all of these situations is not the international teams that come in, it's always the national guys who are responding uh, and doing most of the work. This is a 21st century version of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You guys are all probably familiar with it. Um, and, and I position this because it's useful to start to understand um, how humanitarian responses are coordinated. Um, so along the bottom, these are your basic needs that we need to take care of first and foremost, so things like food, water, shelter, access to healthcare as well for people with injuries. Um, and this is how the international community actually coordinate their responses when they're required to, to go. So they divide it up into clusters, which you've heard referred to quite a lot today. Um, and we would traditionally see rehabilitation as sitting within the health cluster at the top, which is exactly what happened in, in the Nepal situation. 
Then we have the second issue of disability, and disability can't just sit within health, so we see this as a cross-cutting issue. So this is something that we need to take into consideration across all aspects of the response. So if you're setting up a camp, then we need to think about accessibility within the camp. If you're doing protection, we need to think about protection of people with disability, so on and so on. And so we've said that rehabilitation then sits within the, within the health cluster, and it's part of a health response, but also a disability response. And in that context, actually, we can play many different roles. So not, not just the, the traditional roles that people would think of. So here you can see in your uh, top left, as you're looking, community rehabilitation, so going out into people's homes and providing services. Uh, services in camps, so going out and providing assessments in camps, maybe uh, identification of people with disability in camps, providing access to equipment, as well as providing access to rehabilitation. Um, the more traditional sort of outpatient rehabilitation service, so this is a, an example from Haiti. And then over on the bottom left-hand side, acute early rehabilitation, hospital-based rehabilitation, either in a, in a national facility or in the, the very, very bottom you can see in a, in a field hospital, which is my background. But across all of these things, again, to emphasize, we're always thinking about the inclusion of people with disability and, and as a cross-cutting issue for everybody to think about. Now, if we take a step back again and we go back to 2010, Haiti is really considered, I think, a little bit of a watershed, particularly from a rehabilitation perspective, um, where we saw huge needs, but we also saw many problems in terms of how the, the response was run. There were some very, very positive things that came out of Haiti, um, also some not so good things as well. And when we look at the emergency medical response, there was no agreed system of coordination in place for international emergency medical teams coming in. There were no standards that were set. Um, there was nobody looking at where teams should go and how they should work, and as a consequence, we had quite a big breakdown in terms of continuity of care. So many patients not receiving any rehab at all within the health system because the health system had very limited rehabilitation capability then, both the national and the international, but consequently patients being lost. And most of those patients also had no medical records whatsoever. So this creates huge challenges. As a result though, there was really positive action taken. So the SPHERE guidance is a, is a kind of core humanitarian guide that we use. Um, and in 2011, they updated the guidance with some very, very clear information on rehabilitation. So early rehabilitation can greatly increase survival, enhance the quality of life of survivors, and surgery provided without immediate rehabilitation can result in a complete failure in restoring functional capacities of the patient. So really, really powerful statements there coming out in a global humanitarian guidance. And then a little later, WHO, to their, their great credit, moved very, very quickly. And, and produced a, a document and developed a system to allow them to coordinate international medical teams now when, re, when they respond to a disaster. So the only teams that are requested by the government and only teams that meet certain safety standards are gonna be able to deploy. And it's been a very successful system. We saw it used in, in Nepal really um, very effectively for the first time. And again, very clear guidance from them. Rehabilitation specialist support embedded within the team can offer triage, perioperative advice, rehabilitation, and has been shown to reduce length of stay. Uh, and they really were advocating very strongly for rehabilitation at that point. This, in my case, led to the, the development of the UK Emergency Medical Team, which is a surgical field hospital that we, we operate out of the UK. And I'm not gonna talk about that now because I'm talking about that at, I think, about eight o'clock or 8.30 tomorrow morning. Um, but, but that is my position within that team. So this is a multidisciplinary team now with rehabilitation as a core part of its capabilities. And we've done three responses, but what we can see is that despite the fact that we do have rehabilitation embedded within that, that's still not really in the public conscious or even in, in the consciousness of many of the professionals that we work with. So if we look at our response in the Philippines, British doctors save lives in the Philippines. This is a multidisciplinary team. If we look at our response in Gaza, meet the UK doctors heading to Gaza. There's only actually two doctors in that picture there that you can see. If we move forward to Nepal, where actually I was the team leader for a lot of the response, um, I thought, great, now we're gonna get the attention that we deserve, and unfortunately then I was promoted to Dr. Peter Skelton and UK medic Dr. Peter Skelton working. So, so it's really not in the public consciousness that rehabilitation is, is a part of, and a core part of humanitarian response, so we need to change that. But in the Nepal response, we did two things. Our um, medical team supported the spinal injury unit, which is a great unit, but dealing with a very, very high volume of patients. Um, and I also worked with, with WHO, uh, and colleagues at NEPTA and the Ministry of Health to, to establish the, the coordination body, the injury rehabilitation subcluster. But what we realized was that in Nepal, actually things had progressed since Haiti, and, and, and Nepal was in no way um, similar to the Haiti response, largely because of the excellent national response that was there, but there were still 
problems. We still face challenges. Most emergency medical teams, despite the guidance, were still deploying without any rehabilitation capacity. We still had lots of people coming to volunteer without the right kind of training, without the right skills, without the right equipment, and without any real idea about how they were going to contribute. And so that then led to us developing some further documents. So we've worked very closely with a number of colleagues, I think, who are probably here in the room, um, from CBM, from ICRC, to develop minimum technical standards and recommendations for rehabilitation within emergency medical teams. And this now sets out very specific standards that these teams need to adhere to. Um, so they need to include one rehab member of staff per 20 beds if they're an inpatient facility. It lists all of the equipment that they need to include so that they're not just thinking about the surgery, but also, as, as Sunil alluded to, actually access to assisted devices is often limited in disaster. So we need to provide crutches. We need to provide wheelchairs. Um, it includes information on making sure that field hospitals are accessible. That's very good because it reduces the burden on the staff as well as actually um, providing very good access to patients and people with disability. Um, and really critically, there's a, a section on continuity of care, so making sure that we have a, a decent referral system, making sure that medical records include the kind of advice that we as physiotherapists require, such as what is the weight-bearing status of a patient, when is the external fixator due to be removed, and so on. We also then worked with um, a number of the, the global rehabilitation organizations, including WCPT, to publish this, this guidance. And there are some copies on the front if anybody would like one, Responding Internationally disaster, to Disasters. Uh, it's a do's and don'ts guide for rehabilitation professionals. And this is aimed at people who are interested in responding to disasters by leaving their country and going to another country. So it's guidance on how to do that in a, in a positive way that will be in support of the, the host country, not undermining the work that they're doing. Um, it's a, it's a relatively succinct guide, but some, a couple of key points from it. International disaster responders should support, not undermine local professionals who are the experts in their local context. And home and host standards of clinical governance, scope of practice, and research ethics continue to apply in international responses. And I think that's really key, that, that just because you're working in a disaster environment, that's not an excuse to suddenly think that it's okay to discard your normal clinical standards and your normal scope that you would do in your hometown. Actually, the need is probably higher in a disaster than it is in other contexts. And then finally, we worked with uh, WCPT to create a guide on the role of physical therapists in disaster management. This is aimed more at physiotherapists in, in countries who are likely to be affected by disaster. So this moves uh, along the disaster continuum to provide guidance to physiotherapists on how to prepare for disasters, both on an individual level, but also on a hospital level, and then also on a national association level, through to how to respond and then um, how to rebuild. And again, grateful for uh, all of the support that we've received with that from WCPT, but also from colleagues from ICRC, MSF, CBM, and a host of other organizations who have been involved. Finally, and this came up yesterday, there is a, a need, I think, for training for physios, particularly living in disaster-prone countries, to make sure that they're appropriately trained to respond to disasters. Um, there is a model that WHO developed that looks at the kind of training that you need to be able to be a humanitarian responder, so you take your existing clinical skills that you have, um, you then need to learn how to adapt those for a disaster setting because clinical practice in a disaster setting is very, very different from clinical practice in a normal setting. And then you need to train as a team as well. So this is not about us training in isolation as physiotherapists. This is how we work with our colleagues and how we're going to respond together as part of a health system, and it's a systems-based approach. In the UK, we've developed a, a package called Rehabilitation in Sun Onset Disasters that we use for our uh, emergency medical team. Uh, with a, a number of uh, different organizations contributing. And what we're hoping to do is to um, develop this to make this globally appropriate. So it, it's very much focused on a UK context and how we would transfer these skills internationally, but we want to adapt that now. If you want more information, we've just actually opened a website page here, the, the hiuk.org slash UKMT, where we've put all of these documents together so they're all available in the same place. And information on the, the WHO plan is there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, I remind you also that there are uh, resources at the WCPT um, website on disaster management. Um, so you will find all the policies and also training uh, resources uh, that are available. Now, I'm sure there are some questions. The, I open the floor for questions, and um, we are here. Um, we hope that we will be able to reply.
please, uh, there are the microphones uh, in the, yeah? Please yeah. say your name and your, from where you are from. Yeah. Uh, I'm Barbara Rao, I'm working for the International Committee of the Red Cross. I have a question to Mr. Shepard. Um, you didn't include in your admission criteria the spinal cord injured patients and the people with wounds, or we know that these are the most fragile uh, people. So where would you recommend them to follow up their needed rehabilitation? Within ICRC, we, are, we don't have a solution, so we are looking uh, for kind of innovative ideas. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, so yeah, and the reason why we, we didn't include them in the admission is just because of the, the capacity and the, well, more so the, the facilities that we had there. Um, and one of the benefits in linking with the local district or the district hospital was that they could provide that service. So they had um, nursing care and, and surgeons and doctors there. Uh, and that was actually located less than two kilometers from our facility, so we would refer them to the local hospital. Um, and if they did require some wound care and then um, were able to then come to our facility, then we would refer them there for a little while until they were well enough to come to the step-down facility. So I guess actually to finish is that I don't have a good answer for you unless you have a hospital close by. It's representative of a global problem that we face I think as well. I continue to work with medical teams and most of them will say that they won't accept spinal cord injured patients because they don't know what's going to happen to them after. So it, it really is a huge challenge that we face. volunteered in Nepal, not during the earthquake, unfortunately, but is it better? Yeah. Um, so I volunteered in Nepal in 2011 um, as a PT. The challenge I experienced was um, the language, um, because PTs communicate, I mean, you have to, um, in order to instruct and etc. I'm curious to know the number of interpreters that are present um, during situations, uh, like disastrous situations, um, because that was one of the things I struggled with, um, because obviously I don't speak the language and the patients do not speak English very well, and most of them didn't speak any English. It's a very valid question, thank you. I, I can talk from the perspective of the emergency medical team system, first of all, um, and we're moving towards a, a system now where we would only look to teams to respond who actually have the language skills and understand the context in which they're going to be working. So the Ecuador earthquake last year is a, a great example of that, where you had a very strong Ministry of Health. They clearly identified the needs that they had in country, and they requested a very small number of Spanish-speaking teams only to come forward and to respond, and, and that was the way that that worked. Um, that's on an emergency medical perspective. I'll look to my colleagues then to add. Um, yeah, so I'll just I'll echo that. Um, I think one of the, the really important things that we were trying to highlight today is that the majority of care is, um, and well, all of the care should be completed by locals, physiotherapists, and healthcare professionals living in that community. Um, we are actually in no way uh, capable of, or as capable of doing that. Uh, and they're the experts. So um, in most situations, I'd say that you ideally would like people like Sunil and Sorab and Michelle and uh, all the, the great physios there providing the care. Um, in cases where that's not possible, um, then at least having people that, uh, that understand the context, like Pete was saying, and then would be getting into the case of, um, of having interpreters. But uh, I think there's a lot that we can do before that, that stage. Yeah. And uh, if I may also add another consideration, in time of no, non-disaster, of course there is a um, workforce uh, shortage in Nepal, so we know that the physiotherapists uh, are mainly working uh, in the capital in urban areas and uh, remote mountainous areas are not covered today by rehabilitation services. But during the response, um, 
and that uh, the, the physiotherapists uh, were all mobilized and they moved, uh, uh, they were all concentrated in the affected areas, so they were uh, able to uh, actually uh, deliver the service where it was needed. It was not sufficient, of course, extra resources needed to be mobilized, but they really represented the, the core um, uh, workforce regarding uh, physiotherapy needs. Okay, in the meantime, I'd like to ask um, uh, Peter a question. Oh, sorry, the light, I can't okay. see. I just oh, came up ahead. after you started. <laughs> it's um, Nikki Vellet from Brisbane, Australia. Um, we've been doing some work around preparedness, I suppose, and more for um, uh, terrorist type situations, I guess. Um, but, but what you've described has been more um, a rehab response, is what I'm getting. Is there a, a role within the acute? Um, hospital uh, sort of setting as well, and can you comment on that, please? Um, I, again, I can comment initially from an emergency medical perspective, so everything that we're looking at is, is about a health system. It's not about a rehab response. I guess it's maybe just come through because of the, of the audience that we have today. Um, so everything that we would do is, is multidisciplinary, um, and it's, it's looking at the continuum of care from even preoperatively in some cases right through to to discharge, so the emphasis is very much on the team. Um, I think uh, Nishal can probably give a good example in terms of the work that went on in Nepal in the preparedness work that you guys did and the trauma plans. So in Nepal, uh, as we are aware that Nepal is the vulnerable countries for the earthquake, so we did uh, preparedness activities in partnership with Ministry of Health because for every Ministry of Health, disaster is a priority, uh, and the preparedness also comes as a priority. So if I have to give an example of Nepal, four to five years before the earthquake, the preparedness work uh, were already there, and it was uh, focused more on uh, the enhancing the response capacity of uh, the health professionals. I think this is how we do a preparedness in partnership with uh, Ministry of Health. Could I ask a question back? <laughs> well, one of the challenges that we see, I think, is that rehabilitation professionals are rarely included in preparedness planning. So there's often a, a strong focus on mass casualty and the immediate work that's going to happen and, and nothing then about what's going to happen next. Have you had a, a positive experience in Brisbane in that? They have been including allied health in the, in the discussions, but it's been, um, it has been very focused on surgery and, um, and so our roles have been well, what can we do to help that and get patients that don't need to be in hospital out? And um, so sort of moving people through and um, perhaps doing minor um, you know, fractures and things like that. So it's sort of a, a little bit different and I just sort of wondered you know, how that sort of fits, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's supported by a couple of publications as well that have looked in Nepal, but as well in New Zealand, I think where physios struggled early in the response because they didn't have a clear role that was identified, even though they had a huge amount that they could contribute. So it's getting involved in those conversations early within the health system so that we know clearly what our role is. Um, people working in acute early rehabilitation, clearly they're going to be doing that acute early rehabilitation, so from, from day zero, but many physiotherapists are going to be working in musculoskeletal departments and other places, and it's how are they mobilized then in the support of, of the response not necessarily in a, in a terrorist incident, but if we're looking at a huge disaster like an earthquake or something like that. Thank you. Um, Jill Boysenault from the United States. Um, Mr. Pokrell, I was, this is a very pragmatic question, but financially, if the response team is in country, how, um, did you afford to be able to leave your regular job and be mobilized to a part of the country that needed you? Was there any support from the government for that or were there outside donations that um, could help offset your loss of salary? I mean, I, n I understand when the country is in need, people respond, but ultimately as the weeks and months go by, and you're not working in your
primary position and you have no source of income, it becomes certainly at minimum a hardship. So I wondered if you could just speak to the financial part of that. Yeah, thank you very much. So on the first few weeks of the earthquake, uh, our response activities was more focused on Kathmandu and most of the physios are located in the Kathmandu in Nepal and we try to mobilize our network voluntarily. Uh, but later on, the emergency state was called by the Ministry of Health Nepal and uh, the, do the support for the donation was also asked by the government of Nepal and there were a lot of uh, humanitarian agencies. Uh, we started developing the program uh, with the Ministry of Health and expanding uh, the rehabilitation services uh, into the districts uh, with the funding of uh, the donor agencies like USAID and UKAID. Kara, would you like to add? Yeah, so um, of course, uh, since there were huge and extra needs, um, new positions were open and uh, many also junior uh, Nepali physiotherapists were uh, recruited huh? uh, also by international organizations, which somehow um, uh, triggered a discussion at the national level on, again, uh, on the rehabilitation workforce, how can uh, the government uh, address the needs uh, and um, feel the unmet needs in, uh, in uh, physical therapy. Uh, so this is um, not an easy <laughs> task and requires long-term planning. And this is exactly where uh, the Nepal is now in terms of reflection uh, on uh, how to develop uh, the workforce, how to establish regulatory mechanisms uh, once uh, the, ex the funding, the, fund, uh, the funds coming from abroad uh, are finished. Huh? They are already uh, very limited today. So now it's uh, a task of the, of the government to address this, uh, this issue. Mike? Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, Mike Landry, Canada, kind of US. Um, uh, thank you very much to the panel and thanks to all the Nepali PTs in the room for your heroic actions in the moment of. Uh, hey, I, this is fascinating. I'd like to get into this kind of work. What, what do you suggest I do? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic area to work in. It's a really rewarding work to do. Um, for those interested in, in working on a national level, it's about looking at how, what skills can you equip yourself now so that you can contribute to your national response and what can you guys do to, to make sure you're part of that national response. So advocacy within your health system, working with your National Physiotherapy Association, talking to WCPT, looking at your curriculums and seeing how your curriculum can be reflected to make sure that you've got work on, on disasters in there. I suspect your question is probably aimed more at those that are interested in working internationally. Um, so it depends uh, in terms of whether you want to go in as part of the initial emergency response, how quickly you want to deploy. Most organizations that, that do respond to disasters look for people to have uh, a number of years of experience and to have clinical skills that are uh, in the area of need, basically, within the country at the time. So that can be major trauma. That can include subspecialities like amputation, like spinal cord injury. It can even include pediatrics, uh, disability, and other areas. But I think the key thing is to have that experience. Most organizations will also look for people with past international experience. And this is where it starts to get a little bit complicated because how do you get experience without experience? Um, so getting work in a non-disaster context is often a really, really good way to do that. Um, it, it exposes you to some of the same challenges. It, it helps you realize that actually you're not gonna change the world, um, that you're definitely not a superhero that it's the national guys that are doing all the work and you're just kind of there in the background thinking that you're important when really you're not. Um, so that, that is probably the best foundation and the best way to move forward if you're interested in any kind of, uh, of humanitarian response. Um, look to the 
professional organizations, look to Handicap International, look to ICRC, look to MSF. There's a whole number of organizations now, particularly after the, the publication of the emergency medical team standards, that are now going to be including rehabilitation professionals. Um, you can also look to your national emergency medical capabilities. So, for example, in the UK, we have the UK emergency medical team. We have now trained 160 physiotherapists that form part of on-call teams that will rotate through that are on standby and ready to deploy. Um, similar systems are in place in, in many other countries. There's a, a great team out of Australia, um, out of Darwin, that's doing some work in that area. There's another of un, a number of other international teams that are doing the same thing. I can, I'll add a little bit onto that. Thanks for the question, Mike. I know uh, you've mentored me a lot in the past, so I'm glad that I can finally help you uh, get in there, you know? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I think some of the, the initiatives that I've seen in the UK are absolutely amazing. And um, just coming from Canada, where a lot of those opportunities for training aren't available, one of, the, one of the things that I usually suggest is that there are kind of underserviced populations within our own countries and within our own communities, um, and even within our own neighborhoods. So, and you can build a lot of your skills by working with those communities as well. So, as an example, um, in Canada, we have a large indigenous population that is very underserviced uh, in the northern part of Canada. So, uh, and you would, in working there, you develop a lot of the same skills that you would uh, working in development and then uh, consequently in uh, disaster response as well. And come and take a copy of the guide. <laughs> I'm not selling them. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Charmy from the UK. Um, I've just spent a year out in Sierra Leone working as a physio. Um, and I guess my question is, if there is a disaster, I mean, there have been in Sierra Leone, but if there was a disaster, say, in the future, um, and there was a need for rehab to go there, how would you deal with that kind of challenge where there's only two physios in the entire country to work with? Um, it's a good question and, and, and it draws on, I guess, the earlier question about language as well, which is important that, that we can talk about a system where the needs are not so high and then you can pick and choose the needs. In, in a situation like Sierra Leone, clearly the needs are going to be much higher. So this is when the, the international system kicks in and the cluster system kicks in. So, so the role that I took in, in Nepal and working with, with the, the ministry and the WHO was then to try and do a very quick rapid assessment to look at what the actual needs were on the ground so that we could actually draw forward the resources that were required from the international community rather than what's happened historically, which is the international community showing up and saying, hi, I'm here to help and not really knowing what the needs were on the ground. So it's about getting out there quickly and trying to do that. And then it's about making sure that the teams that are coming are coming with the right equipment, that they know the, the culture, that they know the context they're not going to be a drain on local resources, which many teams have been in the past, and that they're going to stay for the right amount of time as well because duration of stay is critical. So, so Phil talking about his project, many, many months, and, and virtually all of the, the international teams that came to Nepal, I think many of them are actually still in place and, st and still providing um, levels of care and support of the, the Nepali response. Um, and so this is where the, the minimum standards come in. Within the, the expanded minimum standards that we've written, there is a, a subsection on something what we, that we call a specialist cell, uh, which is a little bit jargony, but this is for people who want to respond as just rehabilitation responders um, and looking at what that team would then need to have in terms of capability. And it's no longer about getting on a plane and just showing up in the country. Um, it's, it's about saying, I'm going to show up with all of the equipment that I require, with the tents. Um, if it's going to be in a hot environment, I need to bring a generator. I need to, to have a fan within the tent where I'm going to be. I need to understand the safety and security constraints in somewhere like uh, Sierra Leone. I need to be linked into the, the wider health system and part of the coordination mechanism. And so, in a sense, it's, it is starting to restrict opportunities for people to, to go and to travel, but I think the really positive thing is it has the potential to have a huge impact on the quality of care that people receive, and I think this is the, the primary objective behind the initiative, um, and it will make a huge difference. Okay, we take the last question, yeah. Nishal, yeah. from Nepal. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. This is Nishal Shake, and I'm the chair for Nepal Physiotherapy Association. And it, is, it was a great experience for me to work during the earthquake time. Uh, and I really, I'm really thankful to all the uh, uh, presenters here, Kiara, Philippe, Peter, and Sunil, for wonderfully presenting, keeping everything together so nicely. 
Thank you for that. And uh, on behalf of Nepal Physiotherapy Association, I'd like to uh, thank all the uh, people from all over the world who supported us during the time of uh, earthquake and especially the international uh, NGOs and NGOs like Handicap International, uh, IOM, who are actively working in Nepal uh, uh, during the time of earthquake and uh, now also. Uh, especially when Sunil was presenting his, um, was presenting, I was a bit nostalgic because uh, he kept some um, post from NEPTA and on, on one of the posts I was, uh, I, was do, I, I did that post from my house and then uh, that was from the kitchen garden of my house, where, uh, which I was posting, just keeping, trying to keep myself at the very safe position. I had to look up, and my house is three and a half stories. The nearby house the, in the neighborhood, it's four stories. Another one is three stories. My kitchen garden is a little bit smaller one, and I had to keep myself uh, in the safe place so that if there is another sake, I shouldn't uh, be hit by, the, my, by my own house or by my neighborhood's house. So, it was that situation then uh, uh, <coughs> during the time of earthquake. Now, uh, what I'd like to say is uh, for a country like Nepal, in a, which is a very, in a, we're working in a very low resource setting, while, uh, as, uh, while I was working as a president at that time, um, I was in a dilemma like I have to work in the hospital also and being the representative of the association, uh, I had to work a lot, like I used to get a lot of emails, I had to go to the meetings, government offices, subcluster uh, meetings, so uh, at times I used to feel that it is very difficult to cope up with like leaving your job and going for meetings, people would think that okay this man is not working at the hospital, he is in the meetings. I got some complaints like that also from a uh, few, uh, uh, few people and what I'd like to say is like uh, in this hall, there might be, uh, there are definitely leaders uh, uh, from the associations uh, and the countries might be like prone to disaster like Nepal. So uh, this is just my experience. I would like to say that uh, there has to be some person, few people who should work a little differently than the other people. Uh, and it is very nice that I got this uh, suggestion from WCPT and AWP that uh, you should work differently. You are a leader. You need to do this. Don't worry about uh, the rest of the thing. Whatever you're doing is good. So that was kind of a boost up for me and that's what kept me going on during the whole, uh, uh, that crucial period. And uh, that's just a sharing from my side. And uh, one question to me, uh, to the panel is like, uh, I have seen like step down facility, uh, which was very good uh, during the time of earthquake in Nepal. Uh, and uh, I'm not pretty sure that Nepal is still is like free, already Sunil has said it's a very disaster prone zone. And then uh, recently yesterday it was 5.1 Richter scale at Sindhu Palchuk. So it's always scary anytime anything can happen. Now about the step down facility, uh, what I have experienced from few hospitals is that uh, they didn't want to keep up the step down facility because it's a burden for the hospital because you need to send the doctors, physios, uh, nursing staff to the step down facilities and it was like for few, few hospitals who were operating, uh, they thought like it's a burden to them and they, don't want, they just wanted to kick it off and few of the step downs were removed. Uh, so, my question is that, is there any provision that the step down facility should be created by default by hospital in case of uh, disasters? I, I pretty acknowledge the work done by the NGOs and INGOs setting up their uh, step down facility at their own capacity, but is there any uh, possibility to have a regulation that the step down facility be created by default by the at least the tertiary level hospitals during the time of disaster. Okay, thanks for your question. And yes, I, think, you. um, I think you and uh, the Nepalese physios and, and healthcare professionals uh, deserve the, the applause. So uh, I appreciate your thank you, but I'm gonna send it right back 
Um, and thanks for your question. And it is a really good question. It raises a few issues. So um, one of the things that, that came up while we were there is like, what, even, what is a step-down facility? Like when I got there, I didn't even know because there, it's so, um, it wasn't really defined and in a lot of cases it's not. So you would go to uh, one facility, one step-down care facility and it looked drastically different from another one. Um, so that is the, the first issue that comes up and uh, in order to get around that, it's developing standards and guidelines. And that's one of the things that uh, should be coming out any day now is um, a manual of exactly what a step-down care facility is and, and how that should be run. So there should be a little bit more consistency. Um, and then to, so to get to your question of, of if hospitals should be um, having that uh, or implementing those types of facilities already, I think that that would be um, amazing if hospitals could do that as soon as the uh, disaster strike. But the, the issue that, always, that comes up for me is that if you're embedding the step-down care facilities within the hospital, then you're, you're pulling away from those resources that you're trying to, to free. Um, so I think, it, I think that's great to um, have it embedded within the government and rehab facilities. And if there was some way to have additional resources so that you, you're not constantly pulling from the same pool, then I think that's a good idea. That sort of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anishal, also for underlying the, um, the aspect of leadership uh, that is really required in disaster management, uh, not only at the, from the health system level in terms of the overall system of uh, health services, but also uh, in terms of the professional association uh, being able to dedicate time no, to this uh, very specific task to mobilize the resources and to plan uh, for action. So I'd like to um, highlight also other important uh, topics that we have touched uh, during this uh, conversation today. Um, the first one is we talked about how uh, the timing and the model of the response of uh, physical therapists uh, changes and need to be flexible um, to uh, respond to the needs of the uh, survivors of a disaster, uh, not only uh, immediately, but also in the long term. And we, s and we have looked at the different options that we have. Uh, within health facilities, but also in the community and in a decentralized mode. Uh, we have talked about uh, the, the importance of procedures and systems and how, in fact, even preparedness, I mean, all the steps, preparedness, uh, response and uh, recovery, they uh, all need to consider uh, a system, uh, development of a system of intervention, so a high level of connection between also resources, so physical therapies integrated into uh, the broad health system, but also the humanitarian action uh, and the social system in the country. Uh, we have seen how important is the role of the professional associations in making sure that the response is appropriate uh, to the needs and effective. Uh, an external uh, support uh, cannot be as effective and as appropriate as the um, involvement of the local resources. Um, not to say also, not to mention the sustainability issue. We have seen how uh, the, a disaster can trigger the need to develop services uh, as happened in Nepal, but as uh, it happened in uh, Haiti and in many other countries where, uh, that were hit by a disaster. Um, and the importance of quality and standards for safety, uh, for appropriate care, um, and also to uh, ensure uh, the, the best outcomes uh, for, the, for the survivors. So the importance of utilizing frameworks um, and uh, shared uh, standards to do that. Um, I would now like to say a big thank to uh, the three speakers. We, the four of us were um, uh, together, but not only the four of us, but I mean, 
the people on this table were, uh, we were all in Kathmandu at the time of the response. Uh, so it has been a big pleasure to look at, uh, to share this experience with you uh, and to hear also your opinion and uh, reflection uh, about that. So thank you very much.